you players and playerettes, do do debts, amigos, amigos, everybody in between. Welcome to episode 140 of the Game of Crimes. And this is good. This one, um, we're going to get into it here in a minute, but this one is a very special one, uh, and we'll tell you about it in just a minute. But first of all, let me welcome back. It is not, uh, you know, by the time you hear this, we have gone forward in the future. So Murph, you, mm-hmm. by the time people hear this, you will have returned from the Federated States of Micronesia. Now I need you to play. This is Vegas. Put a bet. Are you going to solve the mystery? Are you going to come home with history in the making? Let's certainly hope so. I mean, we've already got uh, three of our team landed yesterday. Um, I'm heading out tomorrow. Get back home on the uh, 12th of April, I think it is. And meeting up with another team member in Denver, so we'll be flying over together. The uh, we're taking two cadaver dogs this one with us this time. Uh, a couple guys from Texas have waived their fees. We're covering all their expenses for them and the, and the dogs. But uh, this is our last shot. I mean, this is this is the fifth trip of the team. It's my second trip over to Micronesia. We're going to the island of Chuk, and the little town is called Weno W E N O. If you look it up. Um, it's right there in Truck Lagoon. This is uh, the whole area is where um, that was the Japanese Pearl Harbor back in, the, in yep. the day prior to World War II. Japan was fighting China, you know, and then they decided to take on the United States to their detriment. But um, anyway, we would certainly like to find something, uh, if nothing else, you know, to, and, and like you say, Morgan, it's, I don't think bringing closure to a family is the right term to use, but maybe bringing proof to 15 families what happened to their family members who got on a commercial airline flight in 1938 and, and just disappeared. Never heard a word from them anymore. Well, hey, look, as always, you know, stay safe. Best of luck. I was just pulling up the map of that area. Mm-hmm. And yeah, like Truck Lagoon, big, big battle during World War II. Um, oh, yeah. But it's, be- I'll tell you what, Murph, <laughs> it's beautiful out there, man. But uh, I'm scrolling out and scrolling out and scrolling out on this map. It's like, you are. <laughs> We're way the hell out there, aren't we? You are way the hell out there. You're north of Papua New Guinea, uh, east of the Philippines. Um, yeah, I mean, and, you know, south and west from Hawaii, but a long way. So, uh, hey, good luck on that. Well, you know, and I'm looking at the weather next week or this week. It's not, this is Monday. I leave Tuesday. It's going to be in the mid to upper 80s, and the humidity. It looks like it's at 87 percent. So, just like being be in Florida, humid. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll get a we'll get a full report when you get back. Well, hey, and in the meantime, guys, also we'll continue on with our quick housekeeping here. Head on over to Apple, Spotify, hit those five stars. It means a lot uh, to us. Uh, we really appreciate your feedback and your comments, uh, even when you give me a hard time. I don't care. I enjoy that. So just go ahead and do that. Head on over to our website, gameofcrimespodcast.com for everything there, including from our previous episode, um, 139, Jeffrey James Higgins. You'll Mm -hmm. see his book there. A lot of good stuff there. Also follow us on that thing they call social media at Game of Crimes on Twitter, Game of Crimes podcast on Facebook and the Instagram. But also go to Facebook, type in Game of Crimes fans. Join our group run by our favorite mafia queen, Sandy Salvato. The, uh, she rules with the iron fist with the velvet glove. Uh, but just join. I think we're up to, we're close to a thousand people. We're having lots of fun inside there. So you got to do it, Murph. You got to do it, right? There are, I, I tell you what, the, the folks on that uh, Facebook fan page are just so much fun. You know, there's occasionally you get some wackadoo that tries to put something in there and, and uh, she nukes them. Sandy. She does. She, she takes care of business. So don't take off the queen there, but everybody else, it's hilarious. I mean, the things that they put on there, I wouldn't see if I, if it wasn't for them putting them on there. So thank y'all and keep it coming. Yeah. And another thing that's hilarious is go to patreon.com slash game of crimes. If you want more content from us, we just got through re- recording 911. What's your emergency? Mm-hmm. Couple of them up there. You're going to find out what it takes to ride the lightning. That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> and what not to say to a dispatcher on a 911 call. Uh, and a couple of them, too. Couple, one was a heart uh, string puller. The other one was, I'm sorry, you said what? You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a little shocking. It's a little shocking. So is a taser. But um, we'll, we'll, we, we, won't, so. we won't give away too much. So, but guys, we got that. We got, uh, you can't make this shit up. We got case of the month coming up, our Q&A, uh, our Narcometer review, and our Warden of the Throne, the thing for you at our highest level. So, Guys, join us over there at patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. Now, this is a show about crime. We talk about bad people doing bad things and bad people doing good things, uh, or or bad people doing bad things to good people. Um, And so we normally lead off, we get into small town police blotter, but not this time. 
Mm-hmm. And there is a reason we're not going to do small town police plotter because at this time, and Murph gets credit because you ran into uh, our next guest, Tim Matson. Um, he was the officer from Pittsburgh that was shot 11 times, stopped, helped stop the active shooter, the Tree of Life synagogue that killed 11 people and wounded seven. So um, you ran into him when you were uh, down there in South Carolina. Yes, sir. Just several weeks ago, I, I was fortunate enough to be the keynote, one of the keynote speakers at the uh, uh, Core Medical Group annual third annual military appreciation weekend i met so many studs and studdits there we've got uh i think i think when i got back i called morgan i think there's eight people we have on our list that i met that we're going to bring on the show and uh, one of those is tim matson now tim this mountain of a man got up to speak and he was hot i mean he was as nervous as anybody i've ever seen he couldn't stand still and he's trying to tell his story and, you know, first of all, you're thinking, well, dude, settle down. Just tell your story. But then he gets into it, and you're just captured and engrossed, as, as our listeners are going to be today, about what he went through, um, just trying to save people he's never met in his life, how that all developed, the aftermath, what he's had to deal with, and what continues in his life today. I mean, you talk about a life-changing event. But today's guest, Tim Madsen, is a true American hero, a man who put everybody else, people he didn't know in front of his own well-being. I mean, he he almost paid the ultimate price here. Thankfully, his buddies got him out of there quick enough, and, and the surgeons were able to do their magic. But uh, this is, uh, I, you know, it's I'm getting all hyped up here just trying to do the intro from Tim. So wait till you listen to this interview, everybody. This is a good one. Yeah, and I, I got to tell you, um, and I, let me tell you, and listen for the end. Listen to what when he was in a very dark place, it is it is such an unusual thing that kept him from going there. Mm-hmm. And we'll have a picture of it up on the website. But uh, hey, um, this truly is, I mean, when we say, when this is, we talk about game of crimes and that there's bad people doing bad things mm-hmm. and bad people doing bad things to good people. This guy did bad things to 11 good people, including four police officers. Four police officers were injured along with three congregants. Um, you know, there's just no way to talk about how evil somebody like this is, but we're not going to find out about it till I ask you, are you ready to play? And in this case, it truly is the biggest, baddest, most dangerous game of all the game of crimes. It is. And, and I'm not going to be trying to be funny or anything here, but truly you do need to get in, sit down, shut up and hold on on this one. Cause this is, this is, this is an excellent example of what American law enforcement, first responders and our military are willing to do to protect our citizens here in the United States. Bring on Tim. Well, back in the 60s, in my day, there was a famous musician by the name of Tiny Tim, uh, and he sang a song called Tiptoe Through the Tulips, and I don't think this is the same dude. <laughs> He's Tiny Tim, but uh, I'm not having heard Tim sing yet. No, not that do you, have a, yeah. do you have a ukulele? No, sir. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, well, that's fine. We'll, we'll get you a ukulele, and then we'll sing Tiptoe Through the Tulips. You just oh, go man. to YouTube sometime and look him up. By the way, if you guys don't know who we're talking to, you heard it in the intro, but it's Tim Matson, Pittsburgh. PD. Yes, sir. Home. By the way, we do have a story about Pittsburgh, too. We'll have to tell you in a minute. But hey, man, first of all, uh, brother, welcome to the podcast. Welcome to Game of Crimes. Thank you for having me on. Now, this was, uh, I, had the, I had the distinct honor to meet Tim at the uh, Military Appreciation Weekend several weekends ago in Beaufort, South Carolina. And a lot of our listeners have heard me talk about that already. Uh, and I'm seeing this mountain of a man walk up there, and I'm thinking, okay, who's this dude? And he starts talking about his experience, and I'm thinking, you know, I really didn't know there were other cops there. I thought I was the only <laughs> cop there. <laughs> but um, I was watching you, Tim, and and I talked to you afterwards, introduced myself, and we got to talking a little bit. Yep. And I got to say, man, you were nervous as a cat on a hot tin roof up there. Uh, I was. I mean, it was very awkward. My heart was bleeding for you up there, but you did a fantastic job. And that's the thing, you know, I told Tim then, I said, you know, when you, when you speak in front of a crowd up there, what I've learned is that everybody in the crowd is just glad it's not them up there talking. (laughs) You know, you got your story across, you got your point across, you got a standing ovation when you finish your story. I mean, talk about being amongst a, a crowd of heroes that weekend. I had a blast up there. I met so many cool people, including you, Tim. 
Uh, I felt very inadequate being included yep. in that group, but was very proud to be there. So thank you very much for being on the show, brother. Thanks for having me. I got to, I got to go last that day and follow some some big shoes, including yours. And I was like, man, why do I have to be last? So I was, <laughs> <laughs> there's definitely some some nerves ramped up. Because oh, yeah. they saved the best for last. That's what they do. Go. That's right. <sighs> and now we're now we've got you. So hey, as we do with everybody. Cosa Nostra, thing of ours. How did you get started in this thing of ours? Considering your size, did you accidentally tackle Terry Bradshaw in the airport <laughs> one day? Because no, who, no. who was the guy we had that uh, had a bad experience with? Uh, he ran into Bradshaw at the airport as a kid. Uh, I don't even remember now. One of our guests we've had. Well, this episode. I mean, we've had 138 episodes out, but one of the guys we had on, I think, started on Pittsburgh PD, and he ran into Bradshaw at the airport one morning. Oh, it was the FBI guy. Um, from the pizza bomber case. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, he he said he was a real jerk to him. <laughs> Bradshaw. I know. Uh, that's funny though. If you tackle Bradshaw, that's pretty funny. <laughs> well, we're neither confirming nor denying you did. But, but so, dude. So, how did you get? So, tell us, like, where were you growing up, and where did you get this idea that you wanted to be a cop? Because I got to tell you. Some of the cars, you were probably a little big for some of the cars. Uh, it definitely was rough. Um, my partner took some videos of me trying to get into some cars, and we laughed about it. But, uh, <laughs> Did it look like a St. Bernard trying to come in through the cat door? It wasn't pretty. It wasn't pretty, but I got in. You know, Getting out was just hard. But <laughs> so, so tell us about how did you get started in this thing? What, where, you know, where were you growing up, and you know, what, what, what led you to think, hey, man, I want to be a cop? So I grew up in a... Right, right outside of Pittsburgh in a uh, town called McKees Rocks. It's probably 10 minutes from downtown Pittsburgh. Um, small steel mill town. I think it was voted one of the worst cities to live in Pittsburgh recently. So it wasn't, you know what I mean, the most easy place. Um, I my Where I grew up was called Preston. It was a steel mill town. My whole family lived there. My grandma in a general store and and my family's still there. Um, grew up there and um my mom was a big proponent. Her hero is Vince Lombardi. So she always preached team and, you know, team comes first. So um, I played football in high school and played football in college. And then when I got out and I was kind of trying to figure my way. Where'd you go to college at? Duquesne University. Oh, okay. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> so what, other than the entire offensive line, what position did you play? Left tackle. <laughs> Left tackle. <laughs> And just tell us how big you are, so our listeners know what we're talking about. So I, I go by three ten, six and four, how tall three are ten, you? Six, six four. four. Yeah. Oh, I thought you were taller than that. Nah, only six four. <laughs> oh, only six two. four and three, <laughs> three ten. Oh my god! So you know, back at back in my day in high school, the biggest guy on our, our football team, I remember him too, Dave Jones. He would have been. He probably wouldn't have even been a punter on most of these teams <laughs> these days. I, we were a small town, but um, but so you go to Duke. What'd you study at the at university? Marketing management. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> Why was that the easiest courses to take, or what? Yeah, pr pretty much, pretty much. It's pretty much <laughs> useless. Hey, so what? What class? What division was Duquesne? Where were you guys at? NAIA, Divis NCAA, Division One, Double A. Okay. The MAC conference. And, okay. Um, Midwest Athletic Conference, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Who were some of the teams you guys played? Uh, Monmouth, Robert Morris, St. John's. They okay. play Hawaii now. I'm pretty sad about that because every other year they get to go to Hawaii. <laughs> 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 wow. There's still time to go back to school. You have probably at least a year of eligibility, right? <laughs> I might. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they got room for a shot up offensive lineman. Yeah, well, he, I, he, he's a little bit heavier now from all the ounces of lead he took, right? A little yeah. bit. All the metal they put him in. Well, let's talk about that. So, your mom instilled that, and in you. you got out of college. So, did, did you decide that is with your size that being in marketing management wasn't the course for you? You know, the career for you, or what? You know, what? Where that did you is, go from there? That is correct. So, when I got out, um, I worked odd jobs. You know, um. And then one day I realized, like, I didn't want to do the same thing every day. And I wanted to be part of a team again. So I figured, you know, law enforcement would be the way to go. I had a bunch of friends my age that went into law enforcement. Um, they went into smaller departments. To me, I was always drawn to the city of Pittsburgh, PD. So um, I applied, but 
ironically, when I applied, they went in Act 47 and put on a three-year hiring freeze. So, What's, What was Act 47? Basically, they say they don't have money and they're told how to manage it. And someone, I don't know exactly who takes over and, and there's no raises, there's no hiring. They put all kind of, implement all kind of rules or, you know, things they have to follow. Well, they should have brought you in. You had a degree in marketing management. <laughs> I did. Right? I did. <laughs> hey, guys, I can help you. I create a more positive image of Pittsburgh PD. I can mm-hmm. make a commercial. I can make a commercial for you. <laughs> you know what you would have been? You would have been Terry Tate, office linebacker. Have you seen those? Yes. Oh, yes. yes. Boom. Don't forget to put the cover on your TPS report. Yes. <laughs> if you use the Joe, make some mo. Uh, those are some of the best commercials ever. Yes, but anyway, are. back to our regularly scheduled podcast. So, um, so, but during that three years, was it kind of, you know, like you said, obviously Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh areas like that, big steel towns, you know, that's kind of the heritage of them. Did you feel like you were going to have to go back and work like steel mill stuff or, you know, do that kind of stuff? Ironically, I did. I became a boilermaker for three years. Um, I had a lot of family who became boilermakers. And, um, Tell boilermaker. us what a boilermaker is other than a drink. I'm familiar with the drink in <laughs> yes. Purdue, but what's a boilermaker? <laughs> so they work, we worked, we did work, they still do, on steel mills and power plants. So basically it's welding uh, tubes for steel mills and power plants. So basically I was a welder. Okay. Nice. And then when I, got the, when I got the call, I went straight from my last job, boilermaking, because you work on and off right into the police academy. Yeah. So, um, so you, what, what year did you start with Pittsburgh? 2005. 2005. Yes. So tell us about now, tell us a little bit about, I mean, I know everybody knows Pittsburgh, but you know, how big's the town, you know, and how big was your academy class? If you remember when you went through. So my class was the second class, um, after act 47. So it was pretty big. There was 46 in my class. So it was pretty big. And there was a bunch of different people. Um, one, He's still on a job. He was a geologist. I was a boilermaker. And there's people from everywhere, like UPS drivers. And so it's pretty interesting, the, the mix of people that, that were there, handful of military people. But it was a pretty diverse group, different well, backgrounds. I assume the steel mill, right? The boilermaker, you, you were union? Yes. I mean, union seems like they would make pretty good money. Did you take a pay cut to go to the police? I did. I did. It took me. A long time to get back to where I was <laughs> working for the city. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So why'd you do it then? Again, I wanted to be part of part of the team again, you know, part of an A team or and not do the same thing every day. Like you gotta work and sit on a bucket and weld every day, you know, but police work. You could go on the same it could be the same call every day, but it's different, you know. Yeah. Different people. So it's that, a different that, domestic, a different complaint, right. different traffic stop, you know, the whole works. Yeah, just, just different. And then the team being part of something like that was another big drive. So when you joined the police department, did you have goals of what you wanted to do other than just get on the police department? Because I know eventually we're going to talk about you being on the SWAT team because that's when we talk about the shooting. Uh, that's what you were on. But did you have goals when you got on the police department and said, I want to do this? I want to do this? No, I, at, at first I didn't. Um, but that's another reason why I wanted to go to Pittsburgh because there's so many opportunities. Like it's a huge department. You have an investigation branch, branch, you know what I mean? Narcotics, everything. So I figured once I got in a door, I could find my way, my direction where I wanted to go. Um, I want to like in patrol. I worked in zone five. Uh, the city of Pittsburgh is broken up into six zones. I worked in zone five, which was the East end of Pittsburgh, a very busy zone. Um, so I kind of, kind of fell in love with the adrenaline rush. So I stayed in patrol my whole career. I worked night turn 12 years before, because then it was 12 years and then the incident happened. So I spent my 12 years night turn in one of the busy zones in the city. Tell us what night turn is, what shift, what hours is that? So we have an early side and a late side. An early side is 2300 to 07. Late side is 2400 to 0800. So depending on what days I could get off, I like Thursday, Friday off. So I usually would pick Thursday, Friday, 2300 to 0700. You got that option? You got an option to what you picked? Yeah. Wow. You did. So they, they post picks and it goes in seniority. Oh, gotcha. So you start picking and it goes in order. So no one so really want, no one want that, to work nights. So. That, that adrenaline rush thing is very addictive, isn't it? 
Yes, and it's tough not having it anymore. Yeah, yeah it is. That that was uh, as you, as you move up in the ranks, you you have less of a well. You still get adrenaline rushes because somebody pissed you off, right? You know, and then you retire and you don't. You know, I mean, you live vicariously through what all your friends are still. Yeah, doing. it's weird not it's it's weird not having it. Murph gets up every morning at six, and if he can pee, he's like he gets an adrenaline <laughs> rush. He goes, "Man, I'm Ooh, good. I'll be a good day." You know, I have goals. They're just, you know, kind of lower. They're different now. <laughs> I'm not wearing the pins yet, so life's good. That's How do you, good. That's we, good. We don't know that, Murph. We don't know that. And just stay seated. I want. By the way, show me your hands. Do not touch. The, I got them up here. I'm not touching anything. Oh, <laughs> you, you don't. You don't know this, but um, Tim. But yesterday, we're trying to finish up a recording with a fellow DEA colleague of Murph's. Three times Murph kicked us off the recording. I don't know what he was doing. So I don't either. That's why I'm, I'm sitting here like an idiot now. Yeah, Just put cuffs on me. Put cuffs. <laughs> if you're into that, Murph, whatever you know. Anyway, hey, but Tim, back to our regularly scheduled podcast, as we said. So, hey, when you got on, um, tell us a little bit too about the city. How big was the city, and and how big was your department? If you remember, number of officers. It was it was smaller. I'm around 800. Um, in my career, it went up to about a thousand. Um, it's back down to 700 officers, 750 now. Um, yeah, they're, they're, uh, they got a pretty rough patrol. It's pretty rough nowadays. Um, so it fluctuated. Um, out of my 46 academy mates, I think there might be 12 of us left for the city. Um, everyone leaves for boroughs. They pay a lot more. So people kind of use the city as a stepping stone to move on. Get started and then move off to one of the boroughs. And um- Yes. Did, did you not do that because of lack of excitement or or why? Yeah, I would I'd probably say lack of excitement. Um, yeah. Hindsight, I wish I would have chased the money and not the adrenaline. <laughs> um, but we're here now, so. Yeah. yeah. So tell us about that, too. So when you're going through the academy, how long is the academy? I think ours was around six months. Because um, I wound up teaching the academy, and it seemed like they kept adding weeks. I don't know why. Um, but it was about six months and then you do three months of field training where you ride with a FTO field training officer. And then after those three months, you could go on your own. If, if you don't need a dummy month, I call it a dummy month because some people need it. The fourth month of field training, uh, <laughs> dummy month. I've never heard that term. <laughs> dummy. <laughs> I, mean, I, don't, I don't know. A, there's a, there's a few people that needed it, but I don't get it. Um, field training but, for dummies. There's a book idea. There is there's exactly. field training for dummies. Follow instructions. Rule number one. Right. It's, um, not, it's not complicated. <laughs> it's not complicated. Hey, but, but considering your size, how was the Academy for you? Like, I mean, PT and stuff, uh, any problem with that? Or, um, I, I would assume that even though you're big and you're kind of in shape after coming out of football and boiler making has got to be still tough work. I mean, you're lifting and moving stuff all the time. Um, how, you know what, tell us about the PT. Tell us about what was the fun stuff for you about the Academy? What'd you like? The, the PT I actually enjoyed because we would do it outside in the winter and most people were miserable. And I figure if you're miserable, might as well have fun with it. So I'd splash in puddles. It'd be freezing cold. Just, just annoy people. But um, I actually cut, I cut down in the Academy to about, I made it to, 250 for like a day and then i passed my pt test and went back to to 300 pounds um holy so cow we, how'd you cut that much weight so i stopped lifting because i didn't have time um you know the academy kept you busy you can't fail test um i remember the first day i pulled up there was motorcycle cops pittsburgh always have motorcycle cops in the winter and everything it was freezing cold and they were just yelling at us putting us in formation i'm like wow what did i get into and not everybody uniform so we had to show up and like suit like ties and stuff and girls out of we you know wear business attire and they're we're PT in it and I remember this girl and she was I won't say her name but she was kind of upset because she was dressed to the nines and it we're PT in the rain it's freezing <laughs> cold and uh the one instructor yelled in her face if you didn't buy your shoes a pay less your your feet wouldn't be wet and I couldn't stop laughing but that made it worse for everybody because I laughed you know but <laughs> and then everybody gets punished because yes. of you. Yes. Oh, but that tells me you might be the rabble rouser of your class. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Stirring that pot every day. I do. I can't believe so that you had a suit on and they had you PTN in mm-hmm. the rain in your suit. Three days. Well, you got to take the jacket off. So you're in a shirt and tie and PT and then rain and cold. Uh, okay. I, I've, I'm, 
I know it's, you know, to, to instill discipline and show you who's in charge, but I fail to see the, the benefit of that. Well, I can tell you that doesn't happen now. Um, I'll it's bet. definitely, it's definitely a lot. Well, they might not even mm-hmm. give you PT now. We so, want to be a kinder and gentler. <laughs> oh, yes. Let me tell you, you wait, wait till you see some of the stuff. I got some friends of mine that are Marines. Um, mm-hmm. And when you see some of the videos that come out of basic training back in, when I went through 1979, my drill sergeants were combat vets. They were out of Vietnam. There was no, as the as the book went, there was no easy day. Right. And now it's like, if you feel upset, you know, you can hold up a red card. And it's right. like, are you kidding me? If I would have said, oh, drill sergeant, I got to go to the bathroom. Sucks to be you. Now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's because the girls' bathroom was already taken. <laughs> I can't. I was popular. What can I say? You know. Uh, I told him uh, no ladies I'll get to you I just got to go to the bathroom first uh, that's pretty nice funny. recovery again thank you back to our regularly scheduled podcast hey don't, don't Murph you know just remember if you're going to get into a gunfight make sure your guns are loaded man you know he's oh, pretty I quick got he's I quick got old man uh, he's, a right. he's quick I was yeah. also a detective, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> what, do, what do troopers detect? I'm not real sure. Uh, yeah, that's so a good We detect question. assholes, and I found two of them on this podcast right now. <laughs> You're just fortunate to be here with us. <laughs> All right. Again, back to our regularly scheduled podcast. So you and your pay less shoe store story, right? Yeah. So the first day, how was it when you was the first day like, yeah, this is what I signed up for? Or did you go, what did I sign up for? No, I'm... I, I, I was, I mean, used to football camps and stuff. They're not as regimented. Obviously, people not yelling at you, putting formation, like trying to get used to formations and stuff kind of threw me off. But, yeah, no, I kind of enjoyed it. Um, what, what was the best part, other than the PT, what what what, what did you look forward to? Or what, as you look back on it now, what was the thing that helped you the most in the academy? So, funny story, and we'll get this, this will lead into – full circle um there was a, a kid in the class his name is mike sell duty i couldn't stand him he was one of them guys that asked a million questions and what ifs and we it got to the point where they would give us like early quits so they'd be like all right you could leave an hour early anyone have questions and he would ask 75 questions and we want up staying two hours so we had to have a talk with him <laughs> like listen wait till we leave to ask questions so um ironically i couldn't stand him um quick story we got assigned in the same zone, became partners, became training partners, taught at the academy together. He became, he was SWAT before me, he became SWAT team, and he actually uh, saved my life that day. So we, came full, we came full circle. And, I, and usually, if I talk to a recruit class, I'm like, look around because somebody in this room could possibly save your life, even if you hate them. So we joke, you know, how we came full circle, but we're pretty tight. Good thing yeah, he asked a lot of questions on first aid, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, that's the thing too. That's, I mean, that goes right back into the teamwork aspect of this whole thing. You know, the people say, well, you, aren't you afraid going up against these gangs? Have you seen our gang? Right. We've got chapters in every state in the United States, multiple chapters. We're the biggest gang out there. That's well, right. I used, I used to say we're the two, one gang, you know, everybody's got their gang size worth it. Anyway, <clears throat> you, you guys saw it anyway. <laughs> Yo, two oh. one. are you down with two one? I'm down with two one. All right. Um, well, that's no, that's interesting because that's what we kind of want to get into. So you get through the academy. Now, tell me, I have to imagine you got yourself into a couple problems in the academy. I uh, just looking at you. I did. Yeah, you being the smart Alec. Go tell I us. Did. I did. <laughs> Look at that shit eating grin on his face. <laughs> uh, there was a. Uh, Kid in my class, James Molnar, he's a little guy. Um, he had like his sweatpants were medium and his sweatshirt was medium. We switched clothes for PT. So I came out and like it was like short <laughs> shorts, ass hanging out with a midriff <laughs> on. And uh, that, that didn't go so well, but it seemed funny. It seemed like a good idea at the time. But. <laughs> Isn't well, that okay. A, isn't that that's what everybody? Well, it seemed like a, hold my beard. Seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> yeah. What was your punishment for that? Oh, they smoked us because it was PT. <laughs> we were getting PT anyway, so I got we got forced to go change, and then we got smoked. All of us. <sighs> did he think it was funny? Molnar thought it was funny, but the instructor <laughs> did not find humor in it. <sighs> See, now in the feds, we had to write a freaking memo. <laughs> 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 write a memo. 
Murph, <laughs> yeah. <riding them> up. <laughs> oh my gosh, that is funny. That's, I mean, that's something like you'd see on Police Academy, the movie. Well, I, I say it all the time. Like I didn't realize how not serious police work is. You know, it's eighty percent not serious, but twenty percent go. You know what I mean? So, um, life or death serious. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's kind of what. Like when I got into the career, I kind of like wow. I was like, man, if people realize how much smoking and joking actually goes on, like it is like movie, like a TV. Yeah, but yeah. you know, if there wasn't that much going on, can you imagine the level of stress and the impact oh, it would yeah. have on people if you didn't, if you weren't like. Hey, you know, right. chill out, dude, you know, because shit's going to hit the fan at any moment and you're going to have to flip that switch and go full beast mode. Exactly. You know, throughout your career, people ask you about police shows and, you know, which ones are realistic. For me, the most realistic police show that was out there was Barney Miller. Remember that old show? <laughs> a little bit. A little He's young, a little young. He doesn't remember. Oh, yeah. I'm not too young, but I'm a little Barney <laughs> Miller. There was a lot of ball busting going on and pranks and, and silliness yeah. and, and, uh, well, if they the did a real, if they did a real police show, what it would look like is you'd go to a call, be there for five minutes, and then spend the next hour doing paperwork. So they'd oh, be yeah. they'd be watching you in the car, you know. Hey, you forgot to put a cover on your TPS report, Tam. Yeah, <clears throat> you, you ride around for seven hours, and then you're in a vehicle pursuit, full pursuit, and four hours of paperwork. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and then the son of a bitch <laughs> eats you. He's out of jail before you finish your paperwork. Unfortunately, that's true. Yeah. Hey, so when you went to the academy too, had you had any experience with firearms? Did you do any hunting or anything prior to that? No, I just got into hunting, and that's because of an organization took me hunting. Um, but no, I did not. I I did shoot. Um, I was I wouldn't say avid shooter, but I was a shooter, um, not a hunter. So I had some familiarization with firearms and shooting. So let's talk about you get out, you you finally pass. You didn't have to do the dummy month, right? So I did not. I did okay. Not. All right. So you're out and you're ready to burn a blue streak through the city of Pittsburgh. So yes. wh- what do you remember like one of your first couple or three calls that you go, yes, this is what I want to do? My first vehicle pursuit. And it, it was shortly when I got out of the academy and I was like, man, this is great. Like you're driving 90 miles an hour through city streets and no one cares. Like you're allowed. And it was like, man, that was like my biggest and first adrenaline dump on the job was vehicle pursuit. Yeah. And I was kind of hooked after that. Like, this is great. <laughs> Until they wreck into a house or something. And then you're like, I'm in so much trouble. Oh, you know? <laughs> but definitely one of my favorite parts of the job was that. You know, I, I was, I got to tell you, the, the first vehicle pursuit I get on riding with a senior guy, Kelly Walls, who's still a really, really good friend of mine. And uh, and he's finally letting me drive. And it was afternoon, you know, 4 to 12 shifts. And this kid just come burning out of an intersection, smoking those tires. And Man, I hit the brakes. I threw it in reverse. I hit the gas. I smoked our tires more than the kid that we're going to chase down. You know, right. <laughs> we finally get him pulled over. Kelly's looking at me like, you're the one that needs the ticket, not him. I'm going to give you the damn ticket. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And that was back in the day when the cars could actually spin their tires. You get some yeah. of these fuel efficient, friendly ones. It's like they can't even break traction. No. Okay. I'll final story drive. two. My first chase, I think I told Murph this, I'm a rookie on Salina. I'm, I'm just finished. I'm same thing. I'm like out of field training. You know, I'm out on my own and it's midnight and I get this chase going and it unfortunately, well, fortunately, because it, we were able to back off after a while, but it was a deputy son and we worked out of the combined law enforcement center. But I'm like, you know, 901, I'm in pursuit. You know, what? it's like, they're like, you know, settle down. Skippy. Right. Our, our dispatchers were police officers at the time. They went civilian years later, but, <clears throat> and so the Lieutenant says, well, how close are you? Like 50 feet. <laughs> you know, we're going 80 miles an hour. <laughs> yeah, Take you probably breath. want to back off. Yeah. <laughs> Take I'll, a breath I'll, there, Skippy. I'll tunnel, <laughs> I'll tunnel vision. Oh, yeah. Um, and you know what? You learn those lessons, though, too, later, right? It's like you, you, I, I, get, I get mad now when I watch some of these pursuits, and you see the guys, no cover, no tactics. They just get the car stopped, and what do they do? They run up there, and they want to yeah. yank the guy right out of the car. And it's like... It's, 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 I, I mean, I remember taking it personal, but guys, it's not personal, but don't go run up there and, and get out, from, you know, you've got cover right, right now with your vehicle. Right. Well, there was just a picture a couple months ago, city, cause we're not allowed to pursue no more. I don't know how they pursued, but they followed a car and I don't, they had to drive through fence, the car and the city vehicle went up in a public swimming pool. I, we got, I got a picture. We have a SWAT thread and I got the picture. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, how would you see 
What are you thinking? Yeah. <laughs> how, how many volumes of reports did they have to write on that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just glad it wasn't me. They had to call divers in to hook the cars up. They, I mean, it, it was only, it wasn't that deep. I don't know. They just made a big deal of it. But literally, Dear Captain, but, nobody was more surprised <laughs> than me when the pool appeared out of nowhere. <laughs> yeah, it just jumped it out. It wasn't on my GPS. I was following the GPS, and the, the GPS took me, said turn right, yes. and I did. And next thing I'm in a pool. Definitely oh, man. He probably had a. <laughs> They probably had a dummy month of field training, I'm going to say. Recycle him for two dummy months, yeah. Send him over to the highway patrol. <laughs> Teach him to write tickets. <laughs> Careful, people. Careful. Remember, I edit this podcast. I can make you look like a hero or zero. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ooh. let's continue on back to our regularly scheduled podcast once again. So you're out, you're getting that stuff. So um, now when you first started, I assume you worked midnights because, you, you know, you, you got the least seniority and that's that's the only one. Or did you pick midnights because that's what you wanted to do? So I picked midnights to work with my field training officer. He was my first partner, too. We worked uh, a couple of years together. And we the month that I worked with him, we clicked. So when I came to Zone 5, he actually he had better days off than me. but um, so you could pick a one man car or a two man car. So historically, I picked a two man car because you got sent to better calls. Um, one man cars get sent to reports. So um, yes, so I, I worked <laughs> with 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 him, and then I wound up working with Cell Duty from the academy for a couple of years. Cool. So tell us about Zone Five. What was the uh, what was the meat and potatoes of the type of calls and the type of crime that was going on in Zone Five? So Zone 5, historically, even before my time, got dubbed the Fighting Fifth. Um, very violent zone in the city. Probably the most violent calls in the city. It goes between that and Zone 1, which is the north side. So you go to all kind of violent calls. A lot of shootings, a lot of gang activity. You guys would have had a field day out there. Um, so... Stuff like that, uh, home invasions. I, my first shooting was was a home invasion. Um, so, a lot of stuff like that. Were you on patrol Wait. then, or were you at SWAT then? I was on patrol my first shooting. I was patrol, and then my next two were SWAT. Well, let, let's talk about that. Well, let's talk about yeah. that first home invasion. So, you say it was your first shooting. What you know? Set the context for us. Tell us the story. So, actually. It was 2010, so I was on the job for five years, and I was just, you know, I'm trying to think what I want to talk to you guys about, and and this was a huge moment in my career because um, I was already complacent. You know, like I said, you want to go to, every call's different, but, so we get sent to this home invasion, and I was actually able, which is a one-man car, and three, two officers and a uh, sergeant got there before me, well, me and another patrol guy pulls up. And um, we get out of the car, and I left my lights on. So I'm like, I got to shut my lights off. This calls bullshit anyways. And then next thing you know, just all kind of gunfire breaks out. And I'm like, so I go running. And you, everything you learn in the academy, again, I'm complacent after five years, which was stupid. But I come running around a bend, and I run into a guy, and he actually has a gun in his hand. They play it in trial. And we run into each other. His gun's out. Mine's not. And uh, he was at slide lock because he went dry. If he had wanted, he had to drop on me. Um, so I actually was able to unholster my gun and shoot him from, they called step two to draw. And uh, after seeing that video, I'm like, man, like I've never, from that day on, I never ever once said the words, this is a bullshit call. And I never once again was complacent. I'm like, geez, like that was the biggest eye opening experience of my career. Like when they played out in trial and I, cause talk about adrenaline my first shooting i was like i had audio exclusion visual was like enhanced um my gun looked real small in my hand but my flashlight was real big it was weird and i could feel it going off in my hand but i couldn't i didn't know i was shooting if that makes sense like i could feel the recoil in my hand so when they played at a trial like it really sunk in i'm like all he needed was one round you know but hey, well, you said you had video. Were you guys wearing body cams, or no, was it no. an uh, in-car camera, or what? There was no video. They had oh, for us, the, they played a trial because it was um projects called East Hills, so they had cameras. They had some video course. surveillance. Yes. Okay, uh, all right. Yeah. So wow, I didn't get to see it. Um, it told trial and then pre-trial they played it. I I needed a minute. I'm like, fuck, that was close. 
Well, when you looked at that, when you saw that video for the first time versus what was in your mind and what you thought about later and what you wrote, how close was it? How far, how close was it to what you thought it was or how far apart was it? It was totally, everything was messed up, like in that aspect. So um, there was actually three actors, five police officers. um, And in my mind, I'm telling them like, this guy ran this way. I know I hit him. He ran this way. And everyone's looking at me like weird, like weird, like there's no way. And I'm like, he was right here. So, um, I get a canine officer. I'm good friends with. I'm like, I'm telling you he was here. So he like reluctantly goes, wait a minute. You, you shoot him, but, uh, he, so he keeps, yeah, this, he, he, he escapes at that point. Yes. I hit him in the arm. Okay. So he runs. So long story short, they find a blood trail. They track him. They get him the next morning in construction site. So fast forward, I come back after seeing a psychologist who our psychologist at the time was a sex therapist, which was weird. All her certificates on the wall were like sex therapist. We talked more about my dogs than anything. You go back mental health. We'll get into that. Well, sex therapist, anytime, uh, anytime you go in there for an internal investigation, whatever, you know, you're screwed, right? Sex therapist. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So when I go up there and, I saw him. He was so far away. That's why no one believed me. But him, he was so close because of the adrenaline dump. Like I could, it looked like he was five feet away, but he was actually so far away that I, I see why no one believed me. It was weird. Well, how far, how far away do you think you were from him when you fired? Oh, that's after we ran into each other. Okay. But, oh, but so the, you did. But the last time I saw him, it looked like in my Not mind, a- it was six feet away, but literally it was 50 yards, 60 yeah. yards away. I'm like, wow. Geez. Yeah, it was weird. I missed the whole. I missed all kind of stuff when I went up there, like sh- like little structures, the whole dumpsters. I'm like, did they just build this? And they're like, no, it was there the whole time. Wow, it's it's very strange when you're in a shooting. What you remember, what you don't. Your tunnel vision, your visual perception is altered so much. Yeah. The sound perception, everything. Now, weird. did time speed up or slow down for you? At times, it was real slow. Um, there was th- like I said, there was three. So when we were in a parking lot after. I struck that guy and we were trying to chase him. The second officer I pulled up with his name is Nick Papa. He, I hear a shot and it sounds like it's in my ear here that one other guy came out behind us and was, they got, he saw him, um, pulled out a gun. And when I turned around, it was like slow motion. I seen Papa shoot him and then he dropped like it was weird. And I'll never forget the moment. He looked at me and he was like, Holy fuck. I hit him. And I'm like, yeah, you did. Like, like it was like a moment of like levity kind of, and then he gets up and runs. I don't know. Bad guys, for some reason, are hard to keep down. And uh, so we track him. So ironically, that canine officer, I want to fall down a hill, get tangled up in his dog. We roll down a hill together and I get bit by the dog. So not only <laughs> was it my first shooting, but I, I got we call it Murphy's dog. Law. I'm like, like if, it, if, it, if it happened, it happened that day. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I've seen some of those videos too. Now, let me ask you the dog, if you remember the breed, was it a Malinois? No, Shepherd, big Shepherd Shepherd. named Dirk. I'll tell you what, we've had some canine handlers on and one of them said, my bell, my Belgian was just fucking nuts. I had to hit him on the skull, you know, just to get him to break grip. They are nuts, but I can't blame the dog. I mean, I'm ro- we were rolling down the hill they together. They just want to bite something, and they say, yeah, and you're yes. big and tasty, man. Look at you. It's like chicken. Oh, look at him. He tastes like chicken. He got, me, he got me right on the thigh. I'm like, you fucking kidding me. That's, that's one of the funniest stories. <laughs> yeah, it was, it, was, it was a bad day. Good but bad. The only funnier story is, uh, this won't come out on his birthday, but Murph, today's birthday is... Kevin Black. <laughs> and we'll have to tell you the story later, man. But Kevin Kevin is known around the United States for crapping his pants, leaving his pants <laughs> in a restroom. And people come, what the hell was that? He didn't fess up to it for like six months. It was me. <laughs> he actually changed it. So, Kevin, here's to you. Happy crap your pants day. Oh, yeah. He super got to, man. You'd love him. You that's, would love him. That's a good one. <laughs> so, um, Whew. So what was what was the outcome of that? A one guy shot, two guys shot. Um, so one oh. guy shot, and they actually uh, killed the the homeowner, a civilian. Um, she was basically storing heroin, so uh, that's why they were at the house. So all three of them got life. Um, they, I think, they were eighteen, but because they went, the other two went with the one. Uh, somehow they all eat the body, so they all got life. 
Felony well, murder. Felony mm-hmm. murder, man. You're responsible for uh, the act if it was foreseeable. Right. Um, now, so this is basically it was a rip, right? They were going in to rip her off. And yes. Now, was this gang related or? Uh, I, I would assume it would be because where it was is big, big gang activity. What was the? What were the some of the gangs in the area that you guys were working? I mean, I know some of them homegrown, right? But any national gangs? There's a lot. Of, there was a. Uh, Ray Street Crips, um, probably the biggest. Um, one of the streets in Homewood was Ray Street, and they were predominantly 7200 block. Um, and then right up the street was Brushton Hilltop. They had their own gang, the Hilltop Gang and stuff like that. So they were all real tight, like right next to each other, but all in different gangs, which yeah. all, which surprised me too. I'm like, why don't they all just be one big gang? But like yeah. us. Yeah, we're 800 yeah. strong. They're idiots. Like, <laughs> they're idiots. That's what. <laughs> neighbors shooting each other because they're in a different gang. I'm like, you're neighbors. That doesn't even make sense. But yeah. Well, let's start setting the groundwork then because we want to talk about October 27th, 2018. So, yes. um, but before that, you've got to make a, you know, I mean, you, you ascend through some things. So when did you decide to join SWAT and how did you end up being on SWAT? So it was 2015 and cell duty. Um, he was on a team and another one of my good friends who was my partner. Was this for after the year home invasion shooting? Yes. So that was 2010, 2015 is when I tried out. So they, every time there was a SWAT tryout, they'd be like, why don't you try out? And I'm like, eh. you know, like I'm old, I'm fat, you know, I'm 300 pounds. We have to swim. I don't know how to swim. Um, that's so, why they call, there's a term for it. It's called breacher. We were just talking about that. Yes. <laughs> You're first. <laughs> Yes, that's what they were like. You're not going to have a rifle anyway, so they're just going to give you a, a, a sledgehammer. Yeah, a ram. Yeah. So, um, you're the kind. Of, you're the kind of guy that everybody else says we'll be behind you all the way, Tim. Yeah, I found that the hard way. <laughs> Plus, I'm too big. I'm too big to miss. It was like shooting the side of a house. <laughs> um, so, 2015, my mom passed. So I was like, man, I needed, I needed something to do. And again, I was feeling my career was kind of getting stale on patrol and. SWAT team is a tighter community, better team orientated. So I was like, all right, I'm going to get focused and train for this. So I actually started training and uh, learned to swim, to pass the swim call. And then I uh, tried out in 2000. Which is important for somebody your size. You don't want to be a rock. <laughs> no, no, but you have to swim fully clothed, which I'm sure you did in the military, but that was a whole interesting uh It is. Experience. It, it, People don't realize too how fatiguing it gets. Uh, no, yeah. no pun intended. When you got fatigues on, but I mean, yeah, you're in there, and that's why one of the first things. Um, tell you about it later. Well, it ended up when I was a trooper. Don't before you diss me here. The story, right? But chasing a, we get a call of a guy who's driven off into the river. The river was at flood stage, and one of the lessons I learned: we didn't get much swift water out there. But when the when it rained and the river really got going, the sandbanks would start crumbling away, and this guy had turned driven his car off the bank but one of the lessons and i remember it it stuck out in my head going through the academy they're saying in some of these places that first thing you do don't think you got to go jump in because we had the sam brown belts you know you had they said that shit will get you caught up and so i'm sitting there disrobing i'm basically down to just my pants you know i've got a t-shirt and pants on right and people are looking at me it's like i said no take your boots off even with your boots on they fill with water we had like the you know, the Tony Llamas and stuff. And so, I mean, that, that was one of the lessons I learned because they would do that with us. You go into a pool and you, you realize how much weight right. you start attracting on those uh, fatigues and stuff. Yeah, yeah. There's a reason that when you go swimming, you only have on minimal amount of clothing. It's just not for sex. It's for right. safety. So the reason why we have to we have don't to worry, swim. Bro, if you in a thong is a safety thing. <laughs> Nobody's going to get near you when you're in a thong, man. I, I don't want to say it. I don't want to say it. That's a thought <laughs> you won't get out of your mind the rest of the day. No, no. <laughs> That's why no. hasn't stood up during this uh, interview yet. So. <laughs> well, I don't have pants on either, so we're even. Oh, okay. We didn't need to know that. <laughs> oh, yeah, uh... That's why they call you Tiny Tim. Got it. Oh, <laughs> shots fired. Shots fired. <laughs> You I'll shot pair. first. Remember, I was I was neutral. I was Switzerland until you want to. All right. So again, back to our regularly scheduled podcast. So hey, but but before it's even SWAT, I mean, you'd been on ten years at that time, right? Why didn't you? Did you put in for promotion? Did you think about you know promoting up? No, I was having. I I always said I didn't want to supervise someone like me, and there's a lot of <laughs> you know. What I mean, there's so a I lot of like, truth. Yeah, right. So I kind of liked it. I got into uh, <clears throat> teaching defensive tactics in the academy. Um, so I would 
worked night turn and teach at the academy. Um, so I was I was pretty satisfied for a while, um, keeping busy. Family so, or anything at that time? I got married in 2015. Um, I met Jen in 2009. Um, she actually worked for the city, and I was working a PT test, and she worked for civil service, and I saw her, and I'm like, there it is. And uh, Six years, though. <laughs> Who's afraid of commitment? You or her? <laughs> <laughs> so, me. I'm definitely me. That's, I got some issues. Uh, but, yeah, so that's how we met. Um Shortly, it was after four, three, uh, three officers were ambushed and killed um, from my shift um, in April 4th, 2009. I think I met Jen in like June. Just tell us real quick about that. You said they were on your shift. What happened? So, <clears throat> me and Cell Duty um, worked a two man car, and one of the people in the shift his wife and him both turned 30. So we actually called off and went to the party. We all worked this shift together. So there was a domestic early morning in April 9th. And they sent two, two men, two single main units. Cause there was no two main units. Cause we called off. So, um, one, uh, Paul Sholo and Maley, Steve Maley got sent. And when they got there, it was a, it was a mother son domestic. And the mom opened the door and told him just come in. But the whole time she watched him put on a vest, load guns and didn't say anything. So basically when, uh, Shula went through the door first, he immediately got shot. And, uh, Poplowski was the actor. And he said, he's mainly surprised him because mainly jumped over him to get in a fight and try and do something. Shortly after that, mainly got shot. And, uh, fell down the stairs outside and Poplowski came out and finished them. But uh, Eric Kelly worked the early side. So 11 to seven, they worked the late side. He lived nearby and he heard the call and he was actually taking his daughter to school and stopped and let her out. He told her he loved her and shit. And then um, went in his plane in his vehicle to see what he could do. And as he pulled up in front of the house, he got, he got ambushed right, right in the street in his, in his personal vehicle. Was so, he in uniform? No, he just got off. We have to be out of uniform, and he lived right there. So he went home, changed, and was taking her to school. So that wound up being a long SWAT call out. I remember getting a call because I was sleeping because we were out drinking all night. And I'm like, I picked the phone up, and officers said, um, Maylee's dead. And I'm like, what? Like, I'm trying to process it. And I just said, make sure there's a car for me and sell duty. So when we got to the zone, there was one police car left, and the keys were at the desk for us. I don't know what we were going to do. It was hours later. But um, we got in the car and went up as close as we could get to it. I don't know, what, again, what, what we were going to do. But, uh, yeah, that, that was a pretty rough day. What happened to the shooter? Uh, he got life. Um, he wound up surrendering. He got, he got hit and realized it hurt and gave up. Well, I just pulled up, as you were saying that I pulled it up, you know, because you remember these things happening because – Obviously, three officers killed is a unique event in law enforcement. It's the, it was like the deadliest attack after 9-11. You know, we had the, the Dallas, the four officers down in Dallas, three officers here. Shows here that he was sentenced to death by lethal injection. Did you, you know if that he's still under a sentence of death? Yeah, I know when I was in the hospital, his death warrant hit our, our governor's desk. So when the governor wanted to see us, he wouldn't sign it. So I, don't, I refuse to see our, our governor. I don't want to see him. Well, save that. We'll talk. Yeah. I already see Murph. Don't blow a blood vessel yet, man. Um, we'll get, that's, well, let's get to that. So, uh, I mean, that's, it's, it's tough to lose people. I mean, yeah. um, you can't see it right here, but right back there is a rubbing from the law enforcement officer Memorial, one of my friends, Trooper yeah. Kent Newport. So, you know, it's tough to lose people. Um, well, kind of sets the stage did did that in any way um you know obviously the, the you go through a lot of the grieving process with the pd they have the funerals did that in any way change your mind about what you wanted to do did it reinforce what you wanted to do how did that affect you so you try to find good and bad situations um there was a lot of guilt because i called off that day i'm like man that should have been my call you know um but what I why took why would it. you feel guilty? You were scheduled off, right? No, we called off to go to a birthday party. Oh. 
So, um, what does that mean? You called off, you just took the day off. So that you could request the day off. And if they don't give you the day off, you could call off sick and they can't refuse a sick day. Um, okay. It's a little around of not getting off. But what I took from it is what they did and how they did it together. Like they put their boots on the ground together. Um, they fought together. They died together. Kelly came, you know, in his personal, he didn't have to. But there's that that team mentality, you know. I'm I'm gonna put my boots on the ground for my teammate. So it kind of set the bar, if you would. I mean, I, I don't I don't know if it sounds bad, but they sent like like the bar high. Like this is what you're supposed to do. You know, you're not supposed to stand in the hallway while kids are dying. You're supposed to put your boots on the ground. So I took that from there. Like that, that was some very courageous shit and some big shoes to fill if I was ever in that situation, you know? Yeah. Yeah. God bless them. How accurate are some of the reports on this too? Because it said that um, even though the mother called in and told 911 they had weapons, the officers never got that information. No. So um, I came in trial and um, she just opened the door and said, come in. Never. I don't know if she told 911. I don't know. I don't remember that part of trial. I just know that they didn't know, and she just opened the door and said, come in. And she wouldn't come out of the house, even when, I mean, he exchanged gunfire at SWAT for hours. Snipers were putting rounds in. One sniper shot 105, 308 rounds through the walls trying to hit him. And the mom wouldn't come out. She stayed in the house the whole time. So I, don't, I don't understand. But I know they wound up, the city did the right thing, tore the house down and everything. So wow. the house no longer stands. And But... Mm, man so let, let's let's move forward then because um when you, you so you tell us about testing for SWAT what's that what's that process like what does it take to get on how 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 selective is it so we have to swim because we have the gateway clippers river boats so if something would happen on the river boats we have to board them so that's why I swim test I think it's 400 meters fully clothed tread water for 10 minutes and then retrieve a brick from the bottom and swim to the, uh, to the edge. And then, um, there's a, a physical test with running pull-ups and sit-ups and all runs a beep test that keeps getting faster and an oral test. You go, I sat in front of, so in Pittsburgh, it's called region 13. So there's 13 SWAT teams, um, boroughs. There's some of them are eight boroughs, um, so there was a couple different SWAT teams on my panel. And then you actually take a written test. So that's just to get into the course. So if you pass all that and it's pass or fail. Oh, and a shooting call. First thing you do is shoot. So a lot of people miss. And I'm like, I don't know why you're all nervous. We have a job. Like, but um, so you shoot and then um you get selected and it's a four week course. And first two weeks are pistol and the next two weeks are rifle, full kitted up. They were, 10 hour days. Um, every Friday is a written test and written test actually hold a lot of weight. Um, 24 people were in my class and they don't have to take any, we don't have to take any. Um, so for all dogs or, you know, not cutting it, we don't have to take them. Um, between three and I was number 10, tens of points separated us. So like one, you threw one bullet, you were, you know what I mean? That was that tight. Yeah. yeah. So they want, I'm taking 13 out of my 24. Wow. Yeah. And you were number 10, you said? Yeah, I was 10. And tell us about, too, the way you guys are signed. Are you guys, uh, is that a full-time or are you guys uh, just as needed? Do they have full-time SWAT teams? So at the time, there were six full-timers. They cut that down to three now. And uh, the rest For of the us. For the city of Pittsburgh, you've only got three full-time SWAT? Yeah. The rest of us are part-time. So you have dual duty. So I'd be patrolling on call 24 seven. There was a lot of narcotics, a lot of narcotics detectives on the team. Um, a couple of canines, a lot of patrol, but yeah, you're just on call. I guess Pittsburgh is not that busy of a place, right? You only need, you know, three full-time SWAT guys. We average about 300 call outs a year. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Holy cow. Not got nothing going on. No. So, um, so when did you fully when did you fully get um, uh, sworn in? You know that whole deal. When did you fully pass SWAT? And they said, "Okay, you're one of us now." 2016. Okay. Um, and then 
they kind of like I want to become a breacher, but you have to do entry and they slowly in- integrate you into specialty things like, you know, people you can become a sniper or whatever. So, but you start off just making entry. If you're lucky, sometimes you just, we call it the five side. You're just in the woods watching a house, you know? Yeah. Uh, what the, like they call it the front five and the back five? No. So we call it the front of the house is one and it goes clockwise, two, three. That's what four. I mean. We used to do that too, like one, two. So two and three equals five, four and one equals five. So they say you take the front five or the back five or. No, no. We do okay. one, two, and five is just means you have a shitty assignment and you're in the woods. You know, you're nowhere near the action. You know, like, we're, like, in a, in a, like, you know, the, the debrief, you have to just say notable. So people be like, I was at a five side. You know, you're just out of the game, just sitting there watching. So what was unless, your first, the, unless the officer shoots them in the arm and they run away? <laughs> this is true. Then, then you're in the game. <laughs> then you're in the game. I got him. I got him, coach. Boom, <laughs> tackled. Well, you know, I'm, I'm not catching anybody in gear. I was 365, so I'm not catching. Anybody. Oh my gosh. Well, well, that and the other problem too. Once you got started running, it was t- it was like a train, man. It would took a while to slow down. So you appreciate this, and one of and you probably make fun of me for this. One of my first call outs was a barricade and nobody's in there. So we're clearing a basement. We have to go down the stairs and, uh, Greg lives. He was, he was worked on the same shift as me and he was on a SWAT team. He, we went through sort of base together. It was in front of me. So we're walking down old basement stairs and I hit the second to last stair and it just breaks. So I fall <laughs> and he's a little guy. I almost smash him. And I just remember looking up and like my team, like, Bypassing me, just looking at me, shaking their heads, laughing. I was just laying there. I'm like, I'm so fat. This is embarrassing. You know, just laying on my well, back. <laughs> well, you got well, you got 50, 60 pounds of gear on too, right? Yeah. yeah were you yeah. like a turtle? You were just laying there till just somebody helped there. you up. Well, I didn't want to. I didn't want to get up until they all bypassed me in case someone was in the basement. So no one helped me up. They just all shook their head. And, oh, I had to get up. Now, did you get a nickname out of that, or you know, did you uh, get an affectionate term? No, I did no? not. Oh, okay. know, they were pretty nice i mean i heard about it but yeah <laughs> i it bet was, you did <laughs> it was an embarrassing moment in my career hey so um let's start oh yeah we all have them um yeah. so let's 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 start leading up to um um uh, you know 2018 so um start telling us about the events leading up to that in terms of were you guys getting any intel i mean well, actually, before we do that, tell us about active shooter training, because this is going to be an active shooter situation. Um, we had the guys on, or one of the guys on from Nashville uh, on the uh, Covenant School shooting, the active shooter down there. And we talked about the training Nashville went through. W- what kind of stuff did you guys do from a preparation standpoint for active shooter? So in patrol, the city only put it, put on one active shooter training in my career and a SWAT put it on for patrol. Um, when we train in SWAT, we train for it. You know, we train officer down, we train entry for active shooter. Um, so we operate on SWAT on what we call priorities of life. So based on the call out is the speed of movement we do. So like active shooter in a priorities of life, hostage and victims are number one, number two is civilians. Number three is regular law enforcement fours us and the five is the bad guy. So we train based on that. So active shooter, we're just blowing through rooms basically as fast as we can to, f- to stop the timeline of violence. So we have TAC medics attached to us. They're city medics, but they go through SWAT basic. They just do it with a pistol. They never do rifle and they interject some medical aspects. So basically their job is to save the victims, our job is to stop the violence. So that's basically how we train and we train. Yeah, well, that awkward pause was brought to you by Murphy's Bladder as these both of these guys <laughs> were giving me shit again. <laughs> but you know why I let them do it? Because this apparently is the only enjoyment they have. Uh, you know, <laughs> they're you very know, we lonely were- people. They're very lonely. Both of them are very lonely. <laughs> While we were on the break, I was doing some research here real quick and I, I come up with the same. It says you can lead a trooper to water, but you can't make him think. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God, you're, you're so, okay, you're so back, funny, man. All right, back to our guest, Mr. Tim. We're going to take this on the road. Back to our regularly scheduled podcast. So where we left off, we were talking about the TAC medics being trained, only the pistol. So, uh, and that's what we're doing is, you know, leading up into the kind of training that you had. So, um, you know, finish that out, but then set the stage for us uh, for the day of the shooting. Okay. Along with the TAC medics, we also have team doctors that are actual doctors for UPMC. 
Um, they're not city employees, but they're, they go through swap basic too. Um, we have two now, do they deploy with you on certain calls? Um, that day, the last person in my stack was our team doctor. Um, so, um, the medics, they're trained to clear rooms if they have to, but basically what they'll do is, is leapfrog with us. If we clear a room, they'll move to that room. And if we clear another room, they're supposed to, you know what I mean? Leapfrog. And then if they find, and they did find two survivors, we just leave them with them. They have to defend themselves. One will pull cover. One will work on them. Um, so that's basically what we do with them. Wow. That's, that's, that's that, that translates into big balls to do that. Yeah. In, in the city and in their infinite wisdom won't let them carry their guns in the, in the ambulance. So they have, we have an equipment van, so they have to keep their guns in the equipment van and hope it's there before they get there or they're going to win no gun. Okay, who the fuck is in charge of these decisions? <laughs> Obviously, people who have never been on the receiving end of this yeah. stuff. Yes, yeah. yes, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, that's that's add that to the list of the shit we got to fix when we talk about the governor later too. So, mm-hmm. so let, let's talk about the the day of the shooting. So. Um, are you back? Because obviously this happens during the morning. So are you still working midnights? Or are you working during the day? So start setting context for us. So I was Thursday, Friday off and I was Saturday. So I was off Friday night. Um, I went to the gym in the morning and then I came home and uh, me and Jen got in a pretty heated argument. Um, we were going at it pretty good. And uh, we have an app on our phone called Act 911. And that's how you get the alerts. They put out, you know, manpower for warrants or active stuff like that. So in the middle of this argument, I have a different tone set to it. So it goes off. So I picked the phone up and I just remember it said active shooter officer down. So I was like, I have to go to work. And like I said, Jen worked for the city. Um, she, she'd been around cops. So she knew, you know, she let it go. And the last words that she said to me that day was when you get home, you're out. And basically throwing me out. So I got changed. She went in another room and let's stop there for a second. Couple things. Um, are you, you carry all your gear with you. So when you get a call out, you've got everything, but, but you're in your own, uh, POV or do you have a GOV? No, we have our own POV. Um, which sometimes you sit in traffic for 45 minutes trying to get the call outs, but I kept all my stuff. I, the only thing I would bring in the house at night would be my rifle. Um, I would leave my armor in the car because obviously lugging it, all that around was a pain in the ass. So I bought, I bought like a, I called it a beater. I paid $2,500 for Suburban. So I just kept my stuff in there all the time. Mm-hmm. Well, the other reason I want to ask you that too is that, hey, look, you know, it's stressful work to begin with. Um, but having a big blowout like that right before you go to work, um, how does that affect you mentally? So... Um, we, we talked about this because she, she blamed herself. You know, she's like, your mind wasn't right. Um, I get in a car and I'm driving. I get a mile from the house and I've been on multiple call outs and my second shooting and my first shooting, she was in a picture for both. But I called her and um, she answered the phone real shitty. She's like, what? And I said, bury me where my mom's buried. And uh, she was like, okay. And we hung up. Were you just being a smart ass or what? No, I just, I think by the nature of the call, like, you know, that you're, you're putting it out there. Um, Okay. And when I hung the phone up, I didn't think about her again. So like it was, it was work. That switch got thrown at that point. I'm thinking about, you know, what I need to do when I get out of the car, what I need to do, who, you know, I need to find my team or, or stack up somewhere. So like, and I told her that, you know, she, she was like, maybe if we'd argue, I was like, listen, I'm not trying to sound mean, but I didn't give a second thought to you or that argument after I hung that phone up when I said, bury me where my mom's buried. Then I went to work. Had you ever said that before? First time. What made this different? I just think active shooter and we train that, you know, priorities of life. My life is number three, number four, number three. Yeah. Well, yeah. Back then, so, yep, four. You're right. Four. So you know, yeah, you, I pay attention and make notes. Troopers are very good about that. We don't forget shit. This because they don't have anything else to do. I just swing a big, a big ram and open doors. So I, don't really <laughs> I pick things up. I break them. <laughs> That's I right, break yeah. them. <laughs> All right. Well, so um, as you can see, even we're in interjecting humor into a very dark situation, but. Yeah. 
uh, but but I think that's part of the ability, though, to compartmentalize. You, if you're going to be in law enforcement for any amount of time, you got to be able to compartmentalize and just say, "Look, I'll deal." You park it, you say, "I'll deal with that shit later." But it can't it can't take all of your it can't take you know your available cycles to think about shit. No, you know, at that point, um, it's about the team and you know watching their backs and doing what I need to do. So, what kind of so as you're headed there, um, I'm. I'll just make an assumption. You have your own radio, right? You have a handheld or something. Are you monitoring what's going on as you're going in? No, nah, I'm just, just waiting to get there. Um, Like I said, you're in a personal vehicle. It's a Saturday. And ironically, it's probably the only Saturday in Pittsburgh. There was no traffic. Um, As I was pulling onto uh, an, a freeway, a canine unit, one of my teammates came out of a tunnel. So I just fell in behind him. Okay. He had lights and sirens. So I how got far there. away were you? How far away were you from uh, where you were at to where the shooting was? It took me probably twenty minutes to get there. Um, it was pretty far, it was pretty far because I lived in the West End and this was almost in the East End of Pittsburgh. Um, so like fifteen twenty minutes, and that's that's moving. Like I said, behind that marked vehicle. Had to, okay. had I not got behind it, and it was a normal Saturday. I might not even have made it there until who knows when. Yeah, because infinite wisdom, we don't get that home course. Again, and then they expect you to drive in a POV, unmarked, no lights, no siren, to drive expeditiously to get to an active shooter call. Yes. To the most dangerous calls that you're that any cop's ever going to encounter, most likely. Ironically, Cell Duty was coming from north down, and he passed an FBI, and the FBI guy put on the radio, he thought it was a stolen car. That's how fast he went by him. <laughs> Uh, oh, oh. <laughs> there's so many places we can go with that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right but um so when you're getting there now do you do you get all uh jocked up suited up before you get there um or do you wait till you get there and get suited up as soon as i get there i can probably i could get tacked up in under a minute okay um, you, that's part of the training they'll be like tack up and they time you you know what i mean so they stress you out make you get dressed so as you get there, obviously there's patrol blocking and they let you in and they tell you where, where the, where the command post is, where we're meeting. Um, so we, we actually parked and I was, uh, behind my good friend and he was my partner for a while too. Uh, John Craig, he was actually my team leader on SWAT. We parked and I got dressed and he got dressed and we just start running and we parked so far away. And I just remember running and, coming upon patrol and they just kept pointing. I'm like, how far do we have? Like, I'm too fat for this. I'm 365. I felt like I ran a mile. I'm just running and running, running. Cause the building's huge. Um, I don't know if you saw it on, there was, I took the slide out. It literally takes up a whole city block. So we ran forever and we wound up stacking up what would have been our, uh, two, three corner. So if you're facing it just to the left and, um, you can see a couple of people can dress. So we waited. There was 10 people on my stack before we moved. And the 10th one was Doc Murray, our team doctor. And were shots still being fired at this time? No. Okay. So now he, but the way I'm doing the research on this, when patrol first got there, the shooter was coming out, right? And they engaged in a firefight. So that was another slide um, we took out. Um, it, the police station was one block away. So when a call came out, they were literally there fast. And the first officer, his name's Mead, his last name is Mead. He tried to grab the door handle to make entry. There was mirrored glass. And when he grabbed the door handle, he starts shooting through the door and he got shot in the hand. So he was on his way out. He had, um, I think like 700 or more rounds in his car. They think he was going to go somewhere else. So they actually pushed him back in. Wow. And, uh, Another officer shot at him through a window, and he, by his interviews, he set up that ambush and was waiting for us. Mm. He actually and said he, was, he, he, said he wished sorry, he had his Mountain Dew and cigarettes because it was hot and he was thirsty while he was waiting for us. Oh, poor baby. <laughs> yeah. Well, he had something smoking and ready for him. I, yeah. And I understand he was carrying an AR-15 and three handguns. Is that correct? Three Glock 357 SIGs. Wow. Wow. Well, he's got some pretty strong armament there. And he used the shotgun, like a breaching tool outside, but he dropped it at the door. He didn't take it inside. Wow. Did, was there any kind of security at this synagogue? No. Okay. Other than just a locked door? So, 
I know the door that we made in. So when we made entry, there were six doors and they all had those like, you know, metal things, you know, they block the push bars, right. Crash bar. But yeah. somebody ran out of one of the doors. So that's, we were able to make entry without having to breach the door. So let's talk about this. So as you guys are stacking up, what's the conversation? What's being said? You know, what do you guys, you know, what's the information, the intel that you guys are getting before you go breach? So they gave out two descriptions. So we were thinking there was possibly two shooters. Um, in my mind, I, kn- I know he's the white guy and I figured it was the one shooting at us. You know, like I'm not going to try to remember two descriptions and clothes at this point. And it's obviously it's a guy that's going to bang it out with us. He's, you know, obviously committed. So uh, I just try to keep that in mind. In my mind, the whole time, I don't know why I pictured it was going to be an AK. I don't know why. I just like, I've expected it every room. I went in to make contact with a guy with an AK. It was, I don't know why that popped in my head, but that's what I envisioned. So, um, but, but as you're going in, have you gotten any word yet on, um, uh, obviously one officer has been wounded prior to that, right? Was anybody else wounded? Any other officers wounded before you made entry? Okay. But he was shooting at officers out of the door. He had a couple of them pinned down. Um, they actually did like a, officer rescue with a vehicle to get him out so uh he was shooting at officers but when i was there there was no shots fired until we made contact so now you're the breacher but you don't have to breach do you still maintain the number one position so this is how um how we operate too we do one task at a time meaning they don't want you to be task saturated so when we stacked up on the door cell duty was on one side i was on the other the door handle was on his side, which made him the breacher. Okay. It wasn't locked, but if it was locked, it would be his problem. So that makes me number one. If the door handle was on my side, I'm now breaching. He's now number one. Hey, players, that is the end of part one. Part two comes out, as always, on Tuesday. In the meantime, go check us out at Game of Crimes on Twitter, at Game of Crimes Podcast on Facebook and the Instagram. Also, go check out our website, GameofCrimesPodcast.com. We've got a lot more information there, including our book list. Any book written by our guests will be listed there. In the meantime, go check us out also, patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. It's where we put a lot more content you won't hear on our regular podcast. We go into a lot more topics, and folks, it is a lot of fun. So go check us out, patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. In the meantime, everybody stay safe. We'll see you tomorrow for part two.